All right. This is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 3, Creating New Social Orders, Colonial Societies, 1500 to 1700. Section 1, Spanish Exploration and Colonial Society. So the focus on Chapter 3, as you can see from the title, Social Orders and Societies, uh, when you come across this word social especially, kind of a good thing to think of is, of course, society. And historically speaking, it's kind of like what do we think about how everyday people uh, experience history? You know, a lot of history is about important people like presidents. Uh, you know, we learned about uh, important conquistadors, uh, Christopher Columbus types. Um, but social order, society, social history is focusing much more on, you know, how did everyday people experience these uh, colonial societies in the new world. Social order in particular is how is society structured, right? What is the structure of society? And that could be based off class, wealth, race, uh, the legal system, et cetera, et cetera. So from these years, Prior to the American Revolution, what do we what do we think about colonial societies? In the first section, we're looking specifically at Spain. Recall that the Spanish were the first ones to the New World, conquered a vast amount of territory, and so now we're looking at specifically what did the colonies of New Spain, right, the Spanish colonies of the New World, what essentially did they look like? Uh, beginning with the Spanish social pyramid. Social pyramids are a term used to describe the way that societies are organized. Typically, we use this pyramid because your elite classes will be at the top. Uh, they're fewer in number, typically, and your maybe lower classes are at the bottom, which are typically um, larger in number. So the pyramid is a good way to illustrate this. And in fact, in the case of New Spain, which was the name for the Spanish colony in the New World, the social pyramid was very much organized in this way. For Spain, it's about blood. And what we mean by that is, uh, in this case, Spanish or European. So those who are of 100% European blood, 100% Spanish blood, were typically at the top of society. You had those who were uh, mixed we actually already covered a term used to describe this class of people, right? The mestizo class, that means that you have some European blood, some Spanish blood, and finally we have at the bottom of the social pyramid, uh, no Spanish blood. If you're a pure born Native American, a pure born African, um, or no European blood would probably be a, a better way, but in the Spanish colonies, we're talking mostly about Spanish individuals. and so. Uh, when we think about social pyramids and social orders, well, what does this mean? Well, it generally means that in terms of who has the most access to the resources, who is writing the laws, who owns the land, who has the most privileges in society, those are those at the top. And then, of course, those who have the fewest resources, fewest access to political power, fewest access to legal power, economic power, those generally are on the bottom. So uh, in Spain, this social pyramid very much, and we'll put it in red, very much based off of bloodlines, right? That is incredibly important. The labor system, we had talked about this previously, encomienda, which was Indian labor, a type of slavery in a certain form, uh, prohibited or banned by the new laws, is raced, uh, replaced by this other labor system, uh, repartimento, and this is essentially just another labor system, oops, uh, labor system in the Spanish colonies, right? Another labor system. Um, in North America, uh, we want to focus on two areas because after all, this is a United States history class. And although it certainly would be interesting to talk more about Spanish possessions in South America and Central America, there's a whole history there. We're going to focus more on North America to understand and better understand the development of what eventually becomes the United States. And it's important for us to know that when it comes to a Spanish presence in North America in these early years, right, specifically between 1500 and 1700, Spain has two uh, kind of large presences or presence 
in North America. One is in Florida and one is in New Mexico. And this uh, first section, chapter three, section one, goes into a little bit more detail about what happened in those areas. St. Augustine, Florida, we want to think more about a military purpose here. The Spanish create a fort. In fact, you see it right here. This is a Spanish fort that was created in Florida uh, to protect their land and protect their assets. We also see a uh, conflict between the Spanish, who in terms of religion, we should know that they are primarily Catholic, and a group of Huguenots, which are French Protestants. Again, recall the Protestant Reformation, the conflict between Protestants and Catholic Catholics, and that there's ongoing wars going on between Catholics and Protestants back in Europe. And what happens in the late 1500s in Florida is that French Protestants attempt to build a fort there, Fort Caroline, in which the Spanish discover and massacre or kill the inhabitants that were not willing to convert back to Catholicism. And so this massacre that occurred at Fort Caroline, it was the Spanish massacring the French Protestants for encroaching upon their territory. It really helps us drive home this point of old world conflict translating to the new world. And that very much is a major theme that forever what's going on in Europe between Protestants and Catholics, the war that's going on there, that spills over into the new world in instances like Fort Caroline and the conflict which occurred there. But what's different in the new world than in the old world is the role that the indigenous or Native American population plays. In this case, it was the local Timucua Indians that were displaced by the Spanish in Florida. Uh, this is going to be a reoccurring thing. We'll go ahead and write displacement. Because in all of these instances where Europeans arrive into the New World, there is an indigenous population and those two sides often come into conflict with one another. This was a uh, illustration here at the very top, uh, demonstrating and showing the Spanish ship. I'll go ahead and get a different color so you can uh, see it a little bit better. Uh, here's a Spanish ship and it's showing or illustrating how the local indigenous population is fleeing from this. This further uh, fueled, and this was a term that we talked about last chapter, this further fueled what was called the Black Legend. And this, of course, was the story of how the Spanish had mistreated the Native American population, giving justification to Protestants to further become involved like the Huguenots, like the French Protestants that, that did. Uh, we also get a little bit of a peek into some of the ways that the Spanish attempted to guard their possessions. Sir Francis Drake was an English pirate. And in fact, the purpose for the Spanish to build something like this at St. Augustine, Florida, was to prevent and stop English pirates, French pirates, whatever type of pirate it was, from stealing, of course, the Spanish's or the Spain's most valuable asset in the New World, and that was silver. Again, so coming back up to this point, St. Augustine, Florida, we generally want to think about the Spanish having a military presence there, right? Guarding their possessions in the New World. In Santa Fe, New Mexico, it's a little bit different of a story there. The indigenous population is the Pueblo Indians. And rather than having a military motive uh, for colonization there, uh, here Spain is primarily interested in religious conversion. So we might want to say religion is a bigger role here. The Spanish had hoped there was something economically viable in Santa Fe, New Mexico. That turned out not really to be the case. So it's mostly about converting uh, the Pueblo Indians to Catholicism, which was certainly a motive for Spain in the New World. Here, like in other places, uh, the method of conversion was often harsh. And in this case, it created a revolt. The Pueblo Revolt of 1680 was led by Pope. So we want to write led the Pueblo Revolt.
And the Pueblo Revolt of 1680 was in fact successful in expelling Spain from the region for a certain period of time. Uh, we do want to keep in mind that the Spanish eventually did return, right? They did return to that area. Uh, but in the case of Santa Fe, New Mexico, it was the effort by the missionaries there to harshly convert the Pueblo Indians. Pope, the leader, led a revolt, kicked out the Spanish, uh, and this kind of goes to illustrate or show us the continuing clashes uh, between the new and old worlds.